G'day, g'day YouTube, this is Necro Arcanus X Triple I in association with Bandit1569, bringing you the next episode in Book 1 of the Necrosi Chronicles, Hell's Crusade. I'm really sorry this episode took so long to come out, I meant to make Slash release it on Halloween earlier this year, but I was caught up with my final exams at school, plus the editing program I used to put the audiobooks together crashed after a malware attack on my computer, so... I had to spend time fixing the bloody thing, not to mention I was sick during that time, so the first recording I did turned out pretty wonky, so I had to redo it all several times. So, if you have not yet listened to chapters 1 through 17, then do so now to avoid spoilers because I'm going to recap every last one of them. <sighs> Prologue. A meteor crashes into the forest around Queenstown, Tasmania. John and his friends go to investigate, while talking about their high school graduation party. It turns out that amongst the debris of the meteor is a crystal orb atop an altar, protected by cultists. John snatches the orb before making an attempt to flee, but then he transforms into a demonic warrior and kills the cultists, swearing with his friends to keep things a secret. Chapter 1 30 years later. After World War IV, a Nazi-like empire has taken control of Australia through dodgy politics. John, now an ex-soldier turned mercenary for hire, begins questing to start a rebellion and overthrow the government, and he begins by contacting his cousin Brian, a bartender, and his friend Luke, a freelance gangster, and he tells them to meet them at his house the next morning, after starting a bar fight. Chapter 2, Prison Break. Brian visits John's house in the morning and tells him that Luke had been arrested for murder due to the pub brawl that John started. So John grabs his teenage children, the intelligent, stealthy Raziel, the loud, obnoxious Dante, the strong yet dim-witted Vincent, the werewolf Saberfang, and the shy daughter Adele, and they all take Brian to the prison to bust out Luke. After an all-out fight with the military, in which John shows off the incredible power of dark magic after being heavily wounded, the group save Luke from the electric chair. In Chapter Three, Truth Stranger. <coughs> in Chapter Three, Truth Stranger Than Fiction, John sits Brian and Luke around at home and discusses his plans to rebel against the Empire. He plans to gather his old friends and teach them how to use magic which he can use because of the crystal orb in his possession, which is in fact the crystallized soul of a demon named Diabolos, who chose John specifically to take his powers and prevent the end of the world. John then explains that a side effect of the dark powers he wields is that the user could become corrupted, hence why he is now half-demon, his firstborn child is a vampire with the ability to use black magic, his twin brother is a fallen angel of superhuman speed, and their baby brother has the body and strength of a giant as well as severe mental disabilities. On top of it all, Werewolf Saberfang was adopted when his tribe in Russia was destroyed by a plague, and John took him home when he was only 19, serving in the, serving in the military. And Adele was adopted because her demon mother kidnapped her archangel father, who was to marry a friend of John's who was a witch and John was asked by this friend to find her fiancé. However, just when John was so close to succession, he found out that the demoness wanted the Archangel Seed to bear a child to sacrifice in a demonic ritual. The angel was killed before John could intervene, and the succubus fled when she realised that John was too powerful to take down on her own, so she decided to take Adele's sister with her. John took Adele home out of pity, and that was when she was only five years old. After wrapping up the conversation, John's friend Jack, an agent of the CIA, arrives and helps John send a mass invite to his friends via the internet, as most of them had fled the country to escape the Empire. Once it's all over, Jack leaves to make arrangements to gather the Allies, while John begins plotting to renovate the house into a base of operations. In Chapter 4, Family Matters, John meets up with his friend Bailey, who is an architect, to help him gather materials with which to tear down and rebuild the house. However, 
Alistair plans a cut shot when Vincent warns them that Adele is being chased by the Empire's military lapdogs while she was only going grocery shopping. John calls the boys around to start looking for Adele and their search takes them to the mountains on the edge of town. They are attacked by a family of wombats who have grown to massive sizes due to nuclear testing by the Empire. And when Adele runs into the thick of battle, she is thrown off of the cliffs and Raziel has to catch her. But he does so successfully at the cost of suffering heavy heavy injuries. At the cost of suffering heavy injuries when the pair hit the ground. Injured and tired out themselves, the rest of the group prepare to get home and get out of the rain. In chapter five, No Place Like Home, the family return home to find that the soldiers are searching for Luke at their house, as he is technically an escaped convict and the group plot to clear them out of their house. In Chapter 6, Drowned Night, Raziel and Dante are sent to help Bailey detoxify the water in the sewers, which lead to a water treatment plant that Bailey had built, so that the townspeople could once again have clean drinking water, because at this point in the story, Queenstown is worse than a third world country in terms of poverty and disease. After redirecting the sewers to run through Bailey's treatment plant, Razio and Dante rejoined the now rebuilt base of operations, just as the rest of the family are planting their flag. Then, an assassin known as the Rain Dancer attacks the party, and while her poison blades are more than a match for everybody else, Joan resists the venom long enough to cripple the Rain Dancer before granting Dante the elemental powers of wind, allowing the ninja slash samurai to become a living hurricane of blades and rip the rain dancer apart. Chapter 7, Battle on the Big Bridge. Jack contacts the new rebellion and informs them that he is coming to Tasmania with a convoy of new recruits. But the severe stormy weather is making it impossible to reach Queenstown, as there are anti-air guns stationed all over the coast. Adele has the idea of landing in Gormanston, as it is barely defended, and John agrees to meet Jack there. As usual, he takes the kids with him as he drives out. Passing through Gormiston, the car is stopped by a roadblock and John, Raziel and Adele get out to look for Jack on foot, leaving Dante and Vincent in the car. The boys get a call from Jack saying that he was shot down over Derwent Bridge and there are zombies trying to get into the plane, and the two boys are quick to tell John what's going on. The group hurries back to the car and as they start back up, they find a horde of infected zombies approaching them. John takes them out with a single magic spell, then the family moves on. After reaching Derwent Bridge, the group stops to take a look around, and they receive another call from Jack, saying that the zombies are mutating before his eyes into a sentient community of cannibals who are plotting on world domination. Saberfang, having stowed away in the back of the car, jumps out and informs the group that the virus is the same that killed his own tribe. Those infected with the Nemesis virus are super strong, super smart, and are capable of breeding like rodents. However, they burn easily and explode when submerged in water. Using this knowledge to the advantage, the family seeks out the leader, Gilgamesh, and challenges him to a one-on-one -on -one duel with Vincent, after John sneakily grants him the ability to cast water-based elemental magic, and Adele the power to control the flow of time around her. Vincent uses his newfound power to wipe out the infected in one go, but Gilgamesh refuses to die and instead mutates into a horrific being. The family used their magic spells to hold off the abomination long enough for Jack to arrive, as he had fixed his plane while the zombies were distracted, and he helps take out the creature. However, the extra help seems to do little, so Vincent chooses to end the battle by shattering the bridge with his water powers, throwing himself and Gilgamesh into the drink below. Gilgamesh dissolves in the water and Vincent swims away scot-free. After everybody gathers on the shores, the group meet with Stan and Ethan, who make fun of Dante when Jack's girlfriend and supervisor, Tanya, insults Dante when he tries to flirt with her. In Chapter 8, Another Brick in the Wall, John prepares to start the rebellion henceforth as the Necro Crusaders Sin Invitarum, or the Crusaders who bring death to the forces of evil. John uses his powers to grant Brian, Luke, 
Stan and Jack. The powers to control nature, lightning, blood magic and technology respectively. While Ethan somehow is immune to being granted powers. And thus he decides that the rebellion is just going to be a waste of time and he quits. The first move of the rebellion is to attack the local school, Mountain Heights. Because it has become less of an education centre and more of a torch chamber that forces children into civil slavery. Isn't that the whole point though? The group marches upon the school and they assault the military protecting the area to test out and showcase their new abilities. In Chapter 9, Hunter of the Dark, after clearing the outside of the school, the Necros head inside to look for the warden in charge and interrogate him slash her. However, the elite soldiers are protecting the warden's office well, and Adele takes it upon herself to draw their attention. She flees, and John takes Luke and Saberfang to interrogate the warden, while sending the others to help Adele. However, the three men find nobody inside the office, and instead there is a secret passage to a secret basement and the three decide to regroup the others before investigating it. Meanwhile, Raziel rescues Adele from being gunned down, and after taking her somewhere safe to hide, Adele confesses that she has fallen in love with Raziel, explaining that even though he can be a cruel person, he is always kind to her and he always protects her above all others. So she feels safe at his side, and she tells him that she thinks she won't have the courage to fight unless she has him close by to support her. Ending the confession with a kiss, Adele takes Raziel by so much surprise that he cannot think of a single answer to give. But then the pair are attacked by a whole battalion of soldiers, the leader of them promising all manner of violent demises for Adele. Out of rage, Raziel transforms into a horseman of the apocalypse and obliviates the soldiers in a fell swoop. After transforming back to his normal self, he faints. This quickly leads to Chapter 10 and Justice for All. Raziel recovers and explains to the confused Necros that his magical potential has awakened. Amplified by his rage and temporary insanity of his vampiric bloodlust, Raziel was able to override his physical body with that of the horseman Odeon, who appeared to Raziel in hallucination, and told him that he is the representation of Raziel's soul and will, his true self. Referring to himself as a scion, Odeon states that Raziel has become powerful enough to summon him to fight for a short while, but he also warns that excessive summoning can cripple or even destroy Raziel as time goes on. Taking all this with a grain of salt, John tells the others of his, Luke's, and Saberfang's findings in the warden's office, and he leaves them to search the hidden basement. As the group walks on, Adele asks Raziel about her love confession, and he replies that he'll play along for now, because it apparently means so much for her for the two of them to be in a relationship. Entering the basement, the Necros, apart from Brian, who stays on the surface to barricade the doors behind him, find a secret chamber in which children slaves are forced to power machines to try and open a gate. Before the group could set about to try and free them, Adele suddenly faints and a monster attacks the party, claiming to be sent to capture Adele and kill Raziel. After the beast monologues about its origins, born from the corpses of old sacrificed alongside Jesus Christ on Golgotha Hill, Raziel nicknames the creature the Golgothan and he proceeds to attack it. After a tricky battle, Saberfang uses his ice magic to put out the fire burning in the Golgothan's soul, and he destroys it. In the aftermath, the group realises that the children are all brainwashed and they cannot be saved, so they decide to destroy the gateway that they are all trying to open. Saberfang takes Adele outside so that she can recover from fainting, but then the gateway opens revealing a portal to hell. And it is then that everybody realises that somebody has chained themselves to the gate's doors to try and hold them shut. But they are beginning to be torn apart by the ropes that bind them. John frees the mysterious person who turns out to be a fire demon by the name of Spiran. He used to be the Archangel of Justice, but when he was killed in battle, his soul was placed into the body of an Antichrist, of which there are more than one. 
He rose to be a general in the devil's armies over the years, but after hearing of his sister's plans to bear a Nephilim child and sacrifice it, he abandoned his post to try and save the child. After analysing the demon's story, Raziel concludes that Spirin may be Adele's uncle and he decides to enlist the demon's help to take down the Empire so that he could watch over Adele and protect her as the demon so wishes. In Chapter 11, Race Against Time, Denacros exit the basement and realise that the school has been utterly destroyed while they were underground. Saberfang, was un Saberfang is unconscious in a wreckage nearby but Adele and Brian are nowhere to be seen. After Saberfang is woken up, he explains that a group of young women attacked the school, and they had dragged Brian off somewhere. The group start to track Adele down, and they quickly assume that she had recovered, seen the destruction, and ran home in fear. John takes Raziel, Dante, and Saberfang to look for Brian, leaving the rest to track down Adele, and the four head into the woods. After some time of walking, they find an abandoned, broken-down college and find a secret door to the real college, known as the Young Women's Academy of Silent Hill. There, John finds Brian in the basement, and Raziel finds Adele's estranged sister as a student of the academy. He leaves a note to tell her of her sister's well-being and promises that he will come back and take her to meet Adele sometime in the future. John then arrives and tells Raziel to leave with Dante while he finishes investigating the college alone. Not long after the boys leave, John finds a prison on the top floor and rescues a young boy who was taken captive a few days prior. After busting out and taking the boy home, John returns home to find out that everybody is hard at work trying to cure Adele as she is comatose. Spearin shows off phoenix-shaped side daggers and uses them to heal her by dripping magical phoenix tears into her eyes. After Adele wakes up and learns about her new uncle and the fate of her sister, the episode ends, of a, the episode ends on a cliffhanger as John receives a mysterious phone call. In Chapter 12, A Grave Situation, it is revealed that John's old friend Mikey is trying to inform him about a racial cleansing census passed by the Emperor to wipe out anybody who has foreign ancestries from the previous few generations to try and keep his nation quote-unquote pure. Mikey's family was just killed and he warns that John's is next. John plots with Jack to pick Mikey up and bring him to Queenstown to bury his family. While this is happening, Brian calls to tell John that the soldiers are causing trouble at the pub. So John assembles the rebels to fight. In the midst of battle, Adele gains the ability to call on her personal scion, a seraphim by the name of Hecate and she uses her new powers to annihilate the enemy soldiers by erasing them from time. Then a gigantic robot known as Atlas arrives and takes down Raziel and Adele in their scion forms. After destroying the fountain and the pub that Vincent so likes, Vincent flies into a rage and transforms into gigantic serpent Leviathan, but even he is no match for the towering Atlas. Jack then uses his laser cannon to attack the machine, but the cannon backfires and explodes, tearing Jack limb from limb, while forcing Atlas to expose its core so that it could fire a last resort disintegrator beam. However, John flies into the biggest rage of all and destroys Atlas before it could disintegrate the Necros. But as he tries to crawl to safety and try to wake his fallen allies, he gets shot in the head by an elite and he collapses. In Chapter 13, Jailbreak, John wakes up to find himself in a prison with Brian, who states that the rebels are being experimented on to try and find the source of their magic powers. John takes none of that and he begins to break everybody out. While this is happening, Mikey comes to the rescue and after everybody makes it out, he claims that Adele was taken to the Academy of Silent Hill. The rebels hurry to return to Queenstown to find Adele, but then Tanya picks up the crew in Jack's plane. She explains that Jack underwent cybernetic surgery after his death, reviving him as a cyborg. She and Jack, in his new robot body, then fly the rebels back to Queenstown. In Chapter 14, The Lords of Salem, the rebels find out that the Academy is now on a floating island flying above Mount Owen, and Jack's plane needs repairs before it can fly over there. 
Mikey claims that he can put something together using scraps from a nearby vehicle graveyard. And while the guys are plotting, John receives a letter that tells him to find the Lords of Salem. Leaving the Necros to make arrangements, John sneaks into a military base and after writing a fake order to send a plane to Salem, John stows away on said plane and heads to Salem. There, he tracks down who turn out to be a coven of witches. The leader, Zoe, being the same witch who was to marry Adele's father before he was kidnapped. In addition to her, the witches Brooklyn, Sarah and Chloe help John try and find Adele using their powers to have visions in their cauldron. They see a vision of Adele being stabbed to death and falling off of a building, so the girls use magic to teleport John home so that he can tell the rebels. Chapter 15, Sibling Rivalry John returns home just in time to see Mikey flying a homemade airship called the Ragnarok. Jack is close behind, having transformed into his Scion, a mechanical dragon called Draco Omega. Mikey, now wearing dragon-themed armour, tells John that he figured out how to use sound waves, produced by an electric guitar, to warp the fabric of reality as well as fire shockwaves and laser blasts and was testing D's out on Jack that accidentally turned him into a Scion. The party bundles into the ship and flies up to the academy, and they quickly find Adele, saving her from being lynched by the other students. Then, Adele's demonic mother greets the rebels and tells them her story, about how she wanted to sacrifice a Nephilim and please her master, but she could not find any so she created one. However, the girl's father, the Archangel Samael, interrupted the sacrificial ritual and as a result, Adele's soul was accidentally broken into two halves, the lost half creating Adele's twin sister Kyra. The demoness Shea then tells the story of how she tried to sacrifice the girls five years later, but John intervened and, he, and she was forced to flee with Kyra. Both Adele and Spearin become infuriated and they begin to spew insults but Shia just shakes it off and uses a magic locket to transform into a dragon, calling herself Queen Tiamat. She uses Hellfire to blow up the school and kill the thousands of girls there, as that was her plan all along, to make up for the fact that she could not sacrifice a Nephilim, because as she states, the blood of a thousand is equal to the blood of one Nephilim. She decides to finish her blood orgy with the Necros, but Zoe and Brooklyn show up to help fight Tiamat, and John grants them more powerful versions of the spells they already had. Then they help Adele and Spearin fight Tiamat, while the others try to rescue as many of the schoolgirls as they possibly could. In the end, Tiamat shatters the floating island and cripples the Necros, but Spearin transforms into a lava demon called Abaddon and kills Shea. After the Necros recovered and took the handful of girls they saved home, they set out to search for Kyra. Chapter 16, My Sister's Keeper After Chapter 15, the Necros are celebrating John, Raziel and Dante's shared birthdays, while the Lords of Salem induct a new member into their coven, Reggie, who lost her home and all of her belonging belongings when the Empire claimed them while she was in the hospital after a car accident. When the festivities are over, the family start using a magical technique to search for Kaya, using a crystal dangling over a map in an act called scrying. They find out that she is hidden inside Mount Owen, and the family sets out to find her, only to crash into the mountain when the Ragnarok suddenly shorts out. Chapter 17, Fantasy or Reality the Necros begin to search caves that have mysteriously opened up inside the mountain, and they find out that the cornerstone of all conspiracy theories, the fabled Illuminati, have been using Aborigine people to create a living bioweapon, a mass of flesh that roams around eating everybody in sight. The Necros encounter this creature and they are forced to run away, but the beast attacks Adele and Dante and Raziel fights it by collapsing the caves onto its head. However, Dante is separated and the, beast chase, and the beast chases him into the depths. With Adele crippled and the rest too tired to keep running, John and Raziel venture back into the caves to help Dante. That is the gist of everything up to now. 
so I'm just going to leave you with Hell's Crusade, Chapter 18, March into Darkness. Raziel ran as fast as he could for as long as he could. Eventually, he ran into a dead end, cursing the monster and the people who created it. Behind him, he could hear running, and John emerged from the shadows. In complete darkness, Raziel could now see him clearly. Dad, you're getting a bit slow, he said. John let out a weak laugh. If you sneeze right now, he said, I could still kick your ass before the snot hits the ground. Where's Dante? I tried my best to follow him. I've tried using my twin connection and I've tried using my vampire powers. All that's left is a shout at him. John tilted his body slightly to the right. What's that behind you? He asked. Raziel turned around and there was a small crack in the cave wall with grey flock with grey fog slowly drifting out and dissipating. I bet he wind walked into that crack to escape the wall of flesh. Good thinking, said John. Can you try to follow him? Razel himself transformed into a mist and tried to enter the crack, but a strong breeze pushed him out. No good, he said. We're gonna have to tear it down. Careful, the last few times you've done that you've torn the whole fucking roof down. And Dante says I have no strength whatsoever. Can't believe I'm trying to rescue a sorry ass. Raziel turned around and started to scrape at the wall with his sickle blades. John moved him aside and began to swing his staff like a pickaxe, which turned out to be more useful. Raziel started to move loose chunks of rock and threw them aside. That way, if the beast returned, they would not trip over the rocks. Meanwhile, an exhausted Dante had, in fact, escaped from the demon wall. He trudged on through thick mist, not knowing or caring where he was going, as long as he was away from that thing. Bloody hell, he remarked. Of all the hell holes in the world, I have to end up wherever the fuck this is. Dante could see a light in the distance, and he began to follow it. Eventually, the fog began to thin out, but it became darker, and there were strange flecks floating around in the air. The hell? Dante grabbed a large chunk of substance and he sniffed at it. Ash. Something must be on fire down here. If only I could see my own nose in front of me. Dante let go of the ashes, letting them drift away. This sounds like a job for the Windbreaker. Dante held his sword up above him and began to spin it around. A burst of wind caused the fog surrounding him to thin out further to the point where he could actually see buildings around him. Some of these were nearly twice as tall as the former Atlas. Creepy, he said. Where did an underground city come from? This architecture seems to be of extremely late 19s to extremely early 20s. Dante found a map attached to a bus stop and he decided to take a look. The name of the towns faded away but according to the map I'm at post office and there's a church up north. Dante teared down the map, rolled it up and shoved it into a hidden pocket in his trench coat. Heading north atop a hill with a staircase of a thousand leagues. He eventually found a church, which was of medieval gothic architecture, and was also quite dishevelled and condemned. If Raziel were to buy his own mansion, thought Dante, I bet that's what it'll look like. Dante opened his wings and flew up the stairs. The doors of the cathedral were giant metal grates covered in rust. Upon them were written in bloodstreaked symbols, but Dante did not know how to translate them. Oh, God damn it! I remember Raz trying to teach me this shit a week ago. 
If only I paid attention instead of watching TV. Think, Dante, think. Dante leaned against the stone pillar and placed his hands in his pockets. But then, he felt the map and decided to pull it out to have another look. Only, it had changed. Instead of the map was an old yellow scrap of paper, with similar symbols noted down in blue pen. On the back was a note. I know you won't listen to me so I hid this in your jacket because I know you'll come across a problem you can't solve due to your stupidity and ignorance. Raziel. Dante looked over the runes and he began to translate the door. Death to the living as the flame has no living heart. Cold and abandoned she cries, her fate put in your hands. When it's over, they come to haunt you with a sacrifice from a wasted knife. Lost inside she chooses you. Close your eyes, lucky one. Your family knows you're here. If the two of you cannot escape purgatory, they will join you soon. Suddenly, the doors creaked open, and Dante stepped inside. Great pee, he commented. Dante walked around and began to investigate the various rooms, but the entire building was completely devoid of life. That script must have had a clue as to what I'm supposed to do here, he said. Let's see. Death to the living, as the flame has no living heart. Dante looked around, but all he could see was a demonic sigil painted on a stained glass window. That's the mark of Satan, if I'm not mistaken. I think this bizarre world is some sort of reversal. Like how every other nation in the world is highly advanced, but because Australia's still in empirical slums, it's in a friggin' fourth world country. If that's true, death to the living, flame of no living heart. Death to the living, no living Dante repeated the phrase to himself as he investigated old windows and searched for a flame of sorts. Nothing but fog, he exclaimed. Dante turned around and then he saw a door with a crucifix hanging off it. Attached was a woman wearing a crown of thorns hung upside down. The cross itself was made of a naturally red wood. Strange. On the opposite side of this wall there should be the main hole, but there was no door. Dante tried to open the door, but it was locked. He then peered through the keyhole, but all he saw was a bright scarlet red. Dante walked back out into the rectory area. On a bed was a note with a large brass key tied to it with twine. Dante used the side of his thumbnail to cut through the twine, setting the key free and allowing him to read the note. It's a diary page, he thought. Tuesday 11th. More strange occurrences are happening in this town. Earlier, one of the sacred sisters found a locked door that had materialised in one of the hallways. According to her reports, she appeared through the keyhole and there was a young girl inside. She knocked on the door to catch the girl's attention, but fled when she saw the girl turn around, revealing that her eyes glowed blood red. Dante shivered and continued to read. I asked the bishop about it, and he said that in the town's early stages, children were bricked up inside the walls or they slept as a punishment for the parents' infidelity. Sister Kate led him to the door, and when she and I appeared in the door, the girl was missing, and all we could see was a beautiful Victorian-style room befitting a noble person's vacation house. However, when the bishop looked inside, the room was painted with blood that dripped over the keyhole. He could then see a blood-red eye peering back at him through the keyhole, but when we looked back, we saw nothing. Dante sat down on the bed and hung his head in thought. Why can men only see her? He muttered to himself. He continued to read the rest of the note. Wednesday. I was walking past the strange door again on my morning routine. As I was bringing my washing in, I heard knocking on the door. A folded up note was slipped under and inside was a key. I tried to unlock the door but the lock would not budge. Thinking that the girl wanted something from the bishop, I tried to find him but he had disappeared. I also noticed that the paper held a short poem which in style but not substance was elegantly written. 
taped to the page was the note, which read, The damage done to my flesh, what they say in the name of the damage done to the heart, is the start of the end. The damage done to my soul, I know, goes with the damage done to my life, cursing loud at the chaos. One more soul to the coal, for all. In silence comes two more souls to the coal, for all and in time. Three more souls to the coal, they fall. And knowing that four more souls to the coal won't be old, and you know it. Dante continued to read the rest of the diary entry from here. I was quite disturbed at this, and I went to tell Sister Margaret about it, but she said that she has not seen Sister Kate or the Bishop at all today. We went to tell Sister Mary, but she was not in her room. I told Margaret to split up and meet me back at her room in one hour. It has been three hours by now, so I'm going to have to go and look for her myself. In case I disappear as well, I'll leave a message to whoever finds this. Stay away from that door. I shudder to think that it's connected to the strange fog and ash that fell over the town six months ago. Dante dropped a note on the bed and snatched up the key, eager to find out what was going on. He ran back to where the door was, but it had disappeared. In its place was the map that Dante had picked up earlier, placed in the picture frame on the wall. He looked at the map, but he was puzzled as to where to go. He turned around and he saw the same crucifix as before, pinned to the opposite wall by a long and thin nail embedded to the figurine, embedded through the chest of the figurine. Dante studied the woman on the cross a lot more closely. She was dressed in rags, and the thorny crown was in fact made of barbed wire. Her face was rather small to see the detail, but it seemed to show that she was crying blood. Dante found it eerie the way the eyes pierced right through him, as if she were looking at something on the wall behind him. Dante turned around and leaned right up against the wall, pointing his finger at the map so that the figure's eyes were exactly to the left of his finger. Carefully pacing forward, Dante placed his finger on the map and ducked under his own arm to see what was to the left of his finger. On the map was a hospital with a name that sounded very difficult to pronounce. I don't think this is even Latin, muttered Dante. He began tracing the pathway from the hospital to the church. After figuring out the path, he left the building. Once outside, he peered into the distance and he could easily see the hospital. He took off and flew straight ahead to the building, but as he got closer, it seemed to go further away. Eventually, he had to land from exhaustion. In the distance, he could see a group of robed people in the dis In the distance, he could see a group of robed people walking along the highway. And Dante quickly wrapped his ring well, Dante quickly wrapped his wings around himself like a hooded robe. He then noticed his reflection in the pool on the ground. Ain't good enough, he said. I don't want them to pick me up because I'm too handsome. Dante looked around and saw a half rusted car sitting on the road. He used his katana to ply off a slab of metal, and he began to bend and trim it down, scraping off the rust and the paint. He cut two thick triangular slits so that he could see through it, but then realised that the metal was too thick for a proper slit for his nose. So he stabbed several more slits along the bottom so that he could breathe through his mouth. He left two small parts protruding from the side of the mask and he curled them around to fit his ears. Applying the mask to his face and carefully bending the, me and carefully bending the metal to match the contours of his head, Dante looked back at his reflection. If it were not for the fact that it was noseless, the hockey mask fitted in perfectly. The hockey style mask fitted him perfectly. Then he let his hair fall over the mask, hiding the edges to make it look like his entire head was metallic. Perfect, he said. It's actually hard to see myself in the darkness now. He only hints to red in me eyes. Dante began rushing off to catch up to the group, who were walking at a rather slow pace, 
but they somehow managed to stay. F but they somehow managed to stay 50 meters ahead of him, the entire way. Eventually, the group led Dante to a rather large building and entered. He looked around to see that the building was in fact the hospital he was looking for. He slipped inside the door and started to walk around, and despite how pristine the building appeared outside, the inside was just as broken and run down as the church interior. Dante walked up to the receptionist's desk, muttering, Shame there's no cute receptionist to hot secretary something to flirt with. This solitude is really starting to give me bloody nerves, I don't know how Raz lives with it. Dante then noticed a bell sitting on the counter, and he had an idea. He tapped it once with his finger, and it struck loud and clear like a church bell, and it continued to echo with the sound like an organ pipe. Hoping to see if it would attract anyone, Dante pressed the button on top of the bell, but it did not sound like a bell. An air raid siren sounded throughout the whole building, and the sheer force of pressure from the sound waves nearly caused Dante to black out, thanks to his inhuman sensory levels. As he lay twitching on the ground, Dante could hear shuffling footsteps approaching, and he stood up, turning to look at the hallway to his left. The light of a moonbeam shining through the window in the corner. The light of a moonbeam shining through a window in the corridor suddenly illuminated long, high-heeled legs with a miniskirt atop them. The rest of the figure was in absolute darkness. Sexy nurse? commented Dante. I'll take it. Dante began waving hello. Uh, excuse me, can you give me a hand? The woman's right arm descended into the light, holding a bloody scalpel. Uh, hey, lady? The woman, worked the woman walked further into the light, revealing that her upper body was scantily clad in her bloodstained uniform, but her head was still hidden. Um, are you okay? The woman suddenly raced out, lashing at Dante. He was horrified to see that her face was completely missing. In its place was a fold of plague-ridden skin that seemed stretched over her head. Her dark hair was tied back in a red bandana and balanced a small white cap on top. Jesus Christ, called Dante, barely dodging the nurse's swift agile slashes. He broke his disguise and took his katana out. Stay back. The nurse lunged out with both arms, trying to strangle Dante but he ducked out of the way and cut both of the nurse's arms off with his sword, causing the nurse to scream out not in a painful way, but much to Dante's confusion. Confusion. They claim They came out as a pleased moan. The nurse turned around and somehow vomited something black and foul smelling at Dante before collapsing to the ground. Dante dropped to the ground backwards, propping himself up with his free hand as the spray hit a stone pillar and slowly ran down. He tilted his head back far and smelled the ooze as it continued to run. Rather metallic in composition, he thought, but not even Raz's blood is this dark, so it can't be that. Dante stood up and looked over the corpse, searching for anything of use. He gently rolled the body onto its back and noticed a scrap of paper sticking out of the bra. He grabbed the paper, but before he could read it, he thought he heard a baby crying, which faded out to reveal more footsteps shuffling towards him. Dante ducked behind the receptionist's desk and watched as a whole group of the demonic nurses wandered past, jerking and twitching violently, while clutching various medical tools such as scalpels and scissors. They stood in the middle of the room and seemed to be sniffing around for something but eventually they gave up and froze in place, becoming lifeless statues. Dante stood up properly and leaned on the desk, which made a creaking noise that startled a group of nurses, causing them to start moving around and searching again. Dante hid to avoid being spotted, but eventually came to the conclusion that they were blind and relied on sound. He stood back up and turned around to become nearly face to faceless with a nurse who looked like she was about to look over the desk. Dante gave a barely audible yelp in shock, 
which caused the nurses to twitch their heads once before freezing again. Dante quickly came up with a plan to be rid of them, so he grabbed a chunk of broken wall that was sitting on the floor. Breaking smaller chunks off with his hands, he threw the stones one by one across the room into the right hand hallway from the entrance. The sound of the rock skipping across the tiled floor attracted the nurses and they wandered off. Once the room was empty, Dante sneaked out and ran into his right hand corridor in absolute silence. At the end of the hall At the end of the hallway, he saw that a door was wide open and he decided to walk inside. There was a nurse staring at a TV that was on and full of static, and he could see a chain dangling from a back pocket on her skirt. Dante sneaked up and stole the chain with almost no effort, as the nurse seemed to be too focused on the TV. On his way out, Dante tripped on the power cord for the TV which was lying in the middle of the room, and on further inspection, it wasn't even plugged into the power point at the first place. Confused, he quickly left the room and once in the light examined his treasure. The chain itself held a ring with several keys attached to it, however all but one of the keys was cut in half. Dante read the tag on the intact key. Most of the tag was aged beyond recognition, but the visible letters read out the word AUDIT. Suddenly Dante could hear a woman's muffled voice singing and he began to follow it. I start to search all the dark places that I have found. I tear a hole inside my head to let the demons go. I cut my flesh to purge the hatred from so long ago. All the deep creases in my mind that are torn up somehow. I want to keep the pace. I want to figure it out. I've got to do it this way. If I don't, everything's lost. Have you ever really noticed the blanket of shame from the torment and pain? as you realise that no one's ever been there. Have you ever looked at the violence you hide, always running inside? You can't escape. It's always been there. It's always been there. Dante ran into a locked double door, and the singing was directly on the other side. Looking up, a sign said, Auditorium. Dante realised that the key he found goes to that door, and the key fitted perfectly. Dante thrust the doors open and it was pitch black inside. He took out his phone and turned on the flashlight function. Looking around, the room was like a giant coliseum, with rows upon rows of seats. In the middle of the room was a deep pit to a lower floor. There was an operating table surrounded by nurses and they seemed to be butchering a man who was screaming in pain to the nurse's delight and Dante's repulsion of the sight. Dante ran down to the pit and took a flying leap inside, decapitating the entire group of nurses with one slice of his long katana. He then turned to the men on the operating table. His entire body was torn and there was a black bag over his head with a drawstring tied tightly around his neck. His voice was choked and raspy, probably due to the cord. Thank you stranger, you must get out of here, please. I'm here to rescue someone, said Dante, a girl. Have you seen her? That devil brought nothing but misery. Demons followed in the wake. She's rumoured to be sleeping deep within a catacomb. But her ghost walks the streets of this town. And a dark cult follows her every move. If you want her, just run, run. She'll be the downfall of the world she's let loose on. Where is this place? I just walked into a fog and the next thing I know, Rough Raven. The Forbid Nation is missing on most maps. This place was ghost to start with, as anybody who comes never leaves. However, the girl doomed to soul of a tainted blood, literally transforming the town into a living, breathing nightmare. When you die by the demon's hands, they take you and twist you into one of them. They all seem to have a basis on how they appear, but I don't know how. My friend wrote a book about them. I can help you, but you have to help me. Sure, I'll just cut the bag loose. No! The cult around here, they sacrifice people to save themselves from the curse for a short while. If I'm allowed to leave, then the town will fall further into darkness. 
Our most sacred places where evil is never supposed to breach have already fallen. The dark is that strong. No. You have to kill me to help me, my friend. My friend is a psychiatrist, and his office is on the top floor. But the key is embedded within my flesh. You have to cut me out of life itself and retrieve the key. I'm not sure I can. The prophet says Saviour will come. A fallen angel with a pure heart. They shall cleanse the evil of the town, but at the cost of taking the curse with them. I just want to find the person I'm looking for. I'm not out to save a town or anything. But then again, knowing the circumstances, I guess the two people we speak of are one and the same. Then you are indeed the saviour. You have the ability to free this forsaken place from the evil and take it away with you. I'm willing to give my life to aid the unholy angel who fell from grace, but lives the life of a redeemer. Silence and stillness passed for seemingly hours. Alright, said Dante, I'll do it. He raised his katana into the air and carved out the man's heart, pulling it open. He found a silver key wrapped in barbed wire, and he complained in disgust. Thank God I don't have Stan's powers, he said. I won't be able to wash out this much blood for days. At that moment, Dante could hear a rustling noise. He climbed out of the pit and looked around. First at the way he came in, then turning to the opposite end of the room. A strange door was set at the other end, and it had an upside down crucifix nailed to it. Dante ran over and knelt down mid-stride, sliding into position to peer into the keyhole. Inside was a young girl, her attire vaguely reminiscent of the ghost outfits donned by the Lords of Salem. Her back was turned to the door as she was curled up in the corner of the room, rocking back and forth while quietly crying to herself. Dante pulled the key from the church out of his pocket, still peering through the keyhole. The girl turned around and her eyes were shockingly torn from her head and blood was running down her face like tears. She got up and started to walk towards the door with a mournful expression but stopped halfway across the room. She lifted her head up and Dante's eyes met hers through the keyhole. Freaked out, he backed away from the lock, stood up and attempted to knock on the door, but before he could even raise his hand, the door was thrust open with an inhuman force. Crushing Dante between it and the wall, and the force of impact caused him to pass out, with his head bleeding from both ears. And that was chapter 18. <laughs> I've not been doing this for a long time, so my voice is really, really hurting right now. <laughs> Gotta get used to doing this again. <laughs> now, in case you've forgotten, early chapters of these episodes make references to the Silent Hill franchise, including the Young Women's Academy of Silent Hill. This chapter and the next few are based off of the Silent Hill movies to a degree or throwing in my own twists to make it somewhat original. But similar ideas between Hell's Crusade and the Silent Hill franchise is of the importance of the church and a hospital being major locations, as the Church of the Order and Acamelia Hospital are places that the characters of Silent Hill visit in almost every game. The nurses being overly sexualised while having no face is a trait common throughout the series, starting all the way back in the second Silent Hill game. Additionally, the quote that the sacrificial man says about how the monsters have a basis on how they appear relates to the franchise. The gimmick is that each game revolves around a theme, and the monsters relate to the theme, and are connected to the character through that theme. So each Silent Hill is every person's own personal hell. And it's often theorised that even if several people are in Silent Hill at a time, they actually see the world differently. For example, the theme of childbirth and motherhood is prevalent in Silent Hill 3, relating to the character of Heather. And while she sees monsters and locations that more often than not have a design aspect that is sexual in nature, other characters actually see things quite differently. The character of Vincent in the game does not see the monsters as actual monsters, 
and he actually confronts Heather about this idea. And yeah, members of the religious order in Silent Hill can even see the creatures as angels or even God. Finally, the final part of this chapter of Hell's Crusade that relates to Silent Hill is the poetry that Dante reads above the church door and in the diary he finds later. And the song sung by who was presumably Kyra as he wanders throughout the hospital. They are from two different songs in the Silent Hill franchise. The runes above the door and the diary note that Dante reads comes from the song One More Soul to the Coal, which comes from Silent Hill Homecoming. I'm going to play a few snippets of that right now just so you can hear the lyrics. Also, when Dante is following the mysterious girl throughout the hospital, she is singing the theme of Silent Hill Downpour, which is actually just called Silent Hill. The original version of this song has Jonathan Davis of the band Korn as lead vocals, which is bloody awesome. I'll let you listen to that as well. Silent Hill related note, the part about the girl in a creepy room with red eyes seen through the keyhole is based off a creepypasta story. If you don't know what that is, creepypasta are short horror stories and they have a rather large online community. The pasta I'm referencing in this chapter has a number of names such as the keyhole or white with red, but the story is basically the same. A man checks into a hotel and the receptionist tells him not to look through the keyhole in the room next door. He does so anyway and he sees a woman with her back turned to him. The next day he checks again only to see that there's nothing but red in the keyhole and he assumes that the hole is covered up. He asks the receptionist about the room and she replies that a woman was murdered in that room. Her soul is trapped inside and the creepy part is that she has bloodshot eyes. If that didn't sink into your head, it means that the ghost was staring back at him when the man looked the second time. If you're interested in creepy stuff like that, I recommend you check out the Creepypasta wiki as 
and there are many channels on YouTube with people who narrate these stories like I'm making narration videos of my own book right now. Now it's almost the end of the video and copyright law insists that I give credits to any music that I use in my videos so here goes. During the opening sequence the song Frost plays by the Viking metal band Enslaved. When Dante reaches the church the song True plays which is from Silent Hill 2. Another song from Silent Hill 2 is the song The Darkness That Lurks In Our Mind which plays when Dante encounters the demon nurses in the hospital and when Dante reaches the auditorium a song called The Hour of Morning plays until the end and this song was made by Cruel Deity on the Newgrounds audio portal possible links to that below if I remember also remember that the song One More Soul to the Coal and the song Silent Hill played about five minutes ago so I'm just listening, listing them down here just to be safe. That's all for the music credits. Thank you for listening. I'll try to get back into the habit of making these videos at least once every week or two. In the meantime, until then, check out both more of my channel and my friend Ben at 1569. He's just uploaded our playthrough of the Silent Hills playable teaser. And both Bandit and I are working on playing some RPG Maker horror games on both of our channels which I've still got to get around to recording on my part and Bandit still has to finish the one he's currently doing it's been several months so dude if you're listening little reminder also we've made a playthrough of the Devil May Cry reboot earlier this year check out those videos if you want to hear us making some rather offensive jokes also subscribe to either channel or like the page I set up on Facebook for the Necrosia Chronicles. I update the page every now and then with lore of the series. Speaking of the series, I just finished writing the fourth book. And while I might make a fifth one, I'll run the course of what I have so far and see if people take enough interest. I'll add links to the Facebook page in the bottom if you want to check that out. Until next time, I'm Neko Akanis X Triple R signing off. Stay classy, YouTube.